Finally tonight, it's Masters Week. The first major in golf officially starts Thursday in Augusta, Georgia. A number of pros are playing well, heading into Augusta National, and golf fans including this one, pretty fired up to see who comes out on top. It's a tough course, but here's a challenge the pros playing there will not encounter. Golfers in Australia had to avoid this kangaroo, fascinated by the flag stick on one hole. <laughs> kangaroo even tried to punch and catch the flag. Golfer who took this video says kangaroos are a common sight on the course. Never seen one behave this way and then played through. Thanks for inviting us into your home tonight. That's it for this special report. Fair, balanced, and unafraid. The story hosted by Martha starts right now. Martha. Hello there, Brett. Thank you very much. Coming up tonight on The Story, our interview with Ron Kessler about his controversial new book on the Trump White House. But first tonight, the president comes out of the Easter weekend swinging. The Democrats have really let them down. It's a shame. And now people are taking advantage of DACA, and that's a shame. Saying DACA is essentially dead in the water, so does he mean it? We're going to talk to an angel mom who says she hopes that he does, and a DACA recipient who says he went back on his word. Also tonight, the president continues to hammer away at Amazon. The stock took a dive, but Trump's numbers continue to go up. And what about the approval numbers for the GOP on the Hill? As they indicate, they may be done with major legislation for the year. Remember this, the day after the election? The opportunity is now here, and the opportunity is to go big, to go bold, and to get things done for the, for the people of this country. So now word is that they are probably likely done in terms of work for the year on major legislation. Keep in mind, today is April the 2nd, the beginning of the fourth month of the year. It's hardly late in the game. So what is going on? Chief National Correspondent Ed Henry live with that uh, whole mess of news that's coming out of uh, Washington tonight with the big story for us. Hi, Ed. Good to see you, Martha. You're expecting them to actually work hard on Capitol Hill. That is kind of a unique concept sometimes. The good news for President Trump uh, is that his approval ratings are climbing. Uh, and when it comes to the generic ballot question of whether you're going to vote for a Democrat or Republican in the midterms, uh, Republicans have now narrowed the gap to just five points in the latest Fox News poll. That's a big deal because they had a double-digit deficit late last year, and now it's narrowing. But the bad news for the president, as you just mentioned, uh, is that both Roll Call and Axios, two websites that track Congress pretty closely are declaring that House and Senate Republican leaders are all but done for the year when it comes to major legislation, that they're mostly just going to do executive branch and judicial nominations until after the election, despite the fact that, as you noted, Speaker Ryan and Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell had those high hopes after the 2016 election about immigration reform. Now it appears maybe no DACA deal, no wall either, at least for now, no major infrastructure deal they talked about. They also promised a full repeal of Obama Obamacare over and over. They did succeed, we should note, in eliminating the individual mandate from Obamacare, as well as that major win on tax cuts late last year. But look at all the Republican losses in that $1.3 trillion omnibus spending bill the president said he was reluctantly signing last month. The White House requested a 24% cut in agriculture, wound up with a 10% increase, wanted a 15% cut in labor, health, and education spending. Got a 10% increase, as you see Axios listing there. President wanted a 23% cut in the State Department and Foreign Ops. Got a nearly 2% hike. This may explain why the president stressed GOP unity back in October in the Rose Garden when he had that news conference with Mitch McConnell. Then the president stressed obstructionism from Senator Chuck Schumer and other Democrats, while last month, when he called that 2,000-page omnibus ridiculous, he was clearly pointing the finger at both congressional Democrats and Republicans. Just so you understand, the Republican Party is very, very unified. When we get things approved, we have to go through hell because we have no Democrat support. We have nobody. We don't have a vote from the Democrats. There are a lot of things that we shouldn't have had in this bill, but we were, in a sense, forced, if we want to build our military, we were forced to have. There are some things that we should have in the bill. But I say to Congress, I will never sign another bill like this again. 
Now, that giant omnibus keeps funding the government at those inflated levels through the end of September, which is an important point. You heard the president say, I'll never sign it again. Another omnibus will be needed at the beginning of October to keep the government open. That's right before the midterms. So the president vowing to veto uh, the next omnibus if it's giant and inflated like that again presents him with a great political opportunity to maybe veto it and separate himself from both congressional Democrats and Republicans. But how that plays out in the midterms? anyone's guest tonight, Martha. That'll be interesting. Ed, thank you very much. You. Joining us now, Carl Rove, former Deputy Chief of Staff to President George W. Bush and a Fox News contributor. Carl, good evening to you. Um, you, you know, you think back to that moment where people who voted for President Trump and for Republicans in the election were told, look, we finally had the opportunity that we have been asking for for years and promising that if you give us the House, the Senate, the White House, we are going to get so much reform done. And now it kind of looks like they're just kind of leaning back on tax reform and saying that's the big achievement that's going to get us through the midterms. Well, it is a big achievement. Absolutely. It took 30 years to get it done. Now, I have a slightly different view. Talking to leadership and talking to members, I think we're going to have a very active time in both the House and the Senate. The question is, when are they going to be talking about the same thing? For example, in the House, there's probably going to be a, a vote on a balanced budget amendment. There's going to be a vote on making the individual tax cuts permanent. They've got some infrastructure reforms that they're going to move forward on with the FAA and reforming how we do water resources. That's dams and reclamation projects. There's a whole bunch of stuff they're doing on Dodd-Frank. They've House and Senate right. uh, have both got different bills. The House has a more robust bill that they're going to try and push through. They're going to likely move on a bunch of workforce training things. How do you get people out of poverty? How do you give people skills to get the jobs that exist today when they had skills for jobs? that have gone away, a farm bill itself, and then the right to, to, uh, right to try. In fact, if you take a look at it, the House has been really active. They've passed 451 pieces of legislation that are stuck over in the Senate. Now, the yeah, Senate's but, uh, got Carl, a bigger problem. I hear what you're saying, yeah. and I think some of those would fall under the categories that I'm going to mention. But when you think about draining the swamp, and you look at that omnibus bill, and you hear that what's likely to happen, as Ed just laid out, um, we may get another CR in October, and then probably an omnibus I in December. The president says that will never happen again. But, we, you know, we've seen this movie before, and it happens over and over. There's nothing but increases in spending. And this president promised yeah. that we were going to see something different. I think some voters come midterms are going to look for those results. Oh, I agree with you. In fact, but here's, here's the weird thing that goes on. The Axios study that Ed Henry mentioned refers to what the president's budget laid down and then what was done in the, in the omnibus bill. There's roughly 70, call it nearly $80 billion in additional defense spending offset with 50 some odd, low 50s, $52 billion in, in, in non-defense spending. Do you know what the biggest chunk of that was, Martha? $21 billion of additional infrastructure spending. Now, here's the president talking about wanting to spend $200 billion on infrastructure in, in his own proposal. And, and the biggest chunk of that $52 billion was to be found of domestic spending in the omnibus bill. The additional spending on the domestic side was to be found in infrastructure. Another big increase. Uh, I think it's like the third increase, largest increase, was on Homeland Security. Now, it only included $1.6 billion for, what, for the wall, but the rest of it gave him some of the things that he'd been talking about in terms of personnel and technology and infrastructure. Uh, so it, it's not as always clear when these things get battled uh, around, because I think the president probably won a little bit more than he might have left the impression on the Mexican side. Yeah, it's side. just a question of whether and, or not those opportunities, whether or not that door is going to shut rapidly uh, come, you know, come during the midterms. And the those opportunities might be closed down for another four years, potentially, maybe even longer. Yeah, um, and in, particularly in because, look, because, look, really quickly, the Senate is going to be taken up with three nominations. You think that they're going to be able to approve a secretary of state, a CIA director, and a veterans uh, administration yep. uh, secretary quickly? No, Democrats mm -hmm. are going no, to I use don't. that <laughs> to make the administration believe. Thank you, Carl. Great to see you tonight. You bet. Let's bring in Tammy Thank Bruce, you, Washington Times columnist, and Jessica Tarlov, author of America in the Age of Trump. Both are Fox News contributors. Um, you know, I think a lot of Americans who supported the president give him a lot of credit and Paul Ryan a lot of credit for what they saw with tax reform and what they've seen on a number of fronts. But when it comes to, you know, the voter, Tammy, who said, look, I think he's going to really shake things up. And if he can get the House and the Senate going, too, then we're going to see some real draining of the swamp. It's, it's very tough to move that town. There's no doubt about it. But have you seen enough? 
Uh, I think what we've seen is that President Trump is, is determined to keep his promises. And the American people are seeing that, as has been referenced, I think, before uh, Rasmussen today. He's at 50 percent approval, higher than where Barack Obama was at the same but equivalent that, that's part a of his. That's complete outlier poll, by oh, the way, uh, that uh, uses uh, the likely just voter just, uh, just, uh, just a minute. I'll interrupt you when you're going to that. I look forward to um, it. And yet, <laughs> at the Congress, Congress, of course, has a 15 percent approval rating. So there's a difference there. And I think that what you're looking at uh, is uh, the American people see what the tax cuts and everything else that they want action. They want a man. They want action in the government. They want things to happen. The world is at war. We see all of these other frameworks here uh, at home. And at the same time, 40, as of last month, 43% of his nominees have not been confirmed for offices, including ambassadorships like Rick Grinnell. No, I, I mean, I, I think no matter what side of the political fence you're on, that is something that infuriates Americans. They can see what's going on. And to have Congress who doesn't, as you pointed out, I think they're going to work 75 days well, that's in the it. rest of the year. We, we've yeah. got seven months. Right? I mean, the rest seven of us. Months, 75 that, days of work scheduled. It's insane. And, 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 it's, and yet they don't want to, of course, do anything now because they've got vulnerable members. They don't want to take scary votes. Yeah, but that may not work. Yeah. You know what I mean? They, 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 they might be the scary votes that actually work. To, exactly. To, well, scary to votes that really Yeah, I think but, would make a big difference. You yeah. have to remember that there was actually a bill sponsored by former Representative David Jolly to force them Congress to work a 40-hour work week. When you think about the I fact know, that Americans, that, that's like, it's so offensive <laughs> when you think that the average American is working upwards horrible. of 60 hours a week to just get by, to put you know, food on the table for their families. That's what's going on there. That is the swamp problem. I would, not just because I interrupted you, but because I actually agree with you, would say, I agree with your point about what President Trump is doing. People can see that he is trying. He's out there yeah. saying, calling out Republicans and Democrats alike. That may not be enough to save his party come midterms, but I think that majority of this is actually just cyclical. This is what happens in the midterms. No, it is what still. happens, but, but you know, they, I mean, they have to hold 24 seats. If they yeah. don't hold 24 seats, Which, they're going to end up yeah. with, you know, Maxine, they're going to end up in some sort of impeachment The, the GOP process. itself is, is highly likely. The GOP classically always grabs defeat out of the jaws of victory. They'll probably, they'll make Maybe do it again. Now, we know Don Jr. is going to be on the campaign trail. I would expect the president to be so. Uh, they're still going to be every day, Americans, whenever, but with whenever this they level get their paychecks. They see, and you look at how many seats just in Pennsylvania they, alone are now vulnerable. All right. My point is, is that every week people see the benefits of the tax reform. Every day they see the president on television arguing for his agenda. And you, they don't like what Congress is doing. But this is where each race is local. And, yeah. they've, and they've got to embrace the president and the president's agenda. And we will be better off, well, I'm Jessica, sure. I, I read today that um, the, the Democrats' plan in terms of the tax reform is to say, I know it feels good now, but it's not going to be offset by your rising health care costs. And, and if that's the, you know, if that's the plan, um, I would suggest they might need something more than that. Well, it's better than crumbs. So I think that that is a smart uh, messaging strategy. I think you know, health care is really a winning issue here. That's something that happens on both the Democrat and Republican side to focus on that, what the repeal of the individual mandate will do, how we can improve upon Obamacare to make sure that each American has more affordable health care, I think is a smart place to start. Uh, but to Tammy's point about them using the Trumps, as it were, that didn't help anyone in Pennsylvania's 18th congressional district. And when you look at how many seats are up in California that Hillary Clinton took, I don't think that Don Jr. coming out there to say, you know, MAGA and lock her up is going to win the many seats well, there. It's 24 we'll seats, which is not much back. when you think how many were vulnerable. We will see. Thank you, yeah. ladies. Thank you. It's good work if you can get it. Yeah. Now, 75 yeah. days <laughs> 75 between days. now and the end of the Seven year. Seven months. Whoa. All right. So nearly five decades after the scandal that ended a young woman's life and Ted Kennedy's dreams of winning the White House, a brand new scandal appears to be brewing involving some, quote, powerful people who did not want that movie to be made. And President Trump saying that DACA is officially dead. He says dreamers can blame the Democrats. So what happens now when we come back two true stories from two people whose lives were changed forever in this bitter battle over immigration, a once illegal immigrant who says the president lied and a mother who says if Trump has his way, her son could have still been alive. I have a love for these people, and hopefully now Congress will be able to help them and do it properly. President, what about the doctors? What's going to happen to them, sir? The Democrats have really let them down. They've really let them down. They had this great opportunity. The Democrats have really let them down. It's a shame. And now people are taking advantage of DACA, and that's a shame.
So the White House saying that DACA is dead for now and that the Democrats are to blame. President Trump pulling no punches, saying President Obama's plan to shield so-called dreamers had some chance for survival, but Democrats, quote, didn't care or act. The president's hardline stance on immigration falling on deaf ears in California, where Democratic Governor Jerry Brown just pardoned five illegal immigrants who were all facing deportation, deportation and were accused of crimes, robbery, uh, theft, all, all kinds of uh, you know, pretty rough criminals uh, in the bunch. So that didn't sit well with the president, who tweeted in part, is this really what the great people of California want? In moments, we'll hear from, Aunt, from Mary Ann Mendoza, whose son was killed by an illegal immigrant. But first, Julissa Arce is a former dreamer. She came to the United States from Mexico as a young girl. Despite being undocumented, she climbed the ladder at Goldman Sachs using falsified documents, and she is now a legal American citizen. Julissa, good to uh, have you with us um, tonight. You know, I guess Thank the, the biggest you. question is, you know, the, the president offered 1.8 million dreamers to be able to stay here, a fix for even more than the number that we know exist in the country in return for some funding for the wall. And Democrats, they, they backed away from that deal. They won't take that deal. So doesn't it make it kind of difficult to pin this on the president at this point? Yeah, well, you know, I think that, that it's important to, to sort of set a timeline here. Uh, the president rescinded DACA on September 5th of 2007, so the reason why we're even in these discussions about making a DACA deal is because the president himself ended the DACA program. But that's, but that's, not, that's a little that, bit disingenuous, I have to jump in, because the truth of the matter is, let, let's play President Obama on this in 2012, when, when the program came into being. This is not amnesty. This is not immunity. This is not a path to citizenship. It's not a permanent fix. This is a temporary stopgap measure that lets us focus our resources wisely while giving a degree of relief and hope to talented, driven, patriotic young people. It was always intended to be temporary, Julissa. Yeah, it was only intended to be a temper, and he is right that it wasn't, that it was not amnesty, that it didn't give people a path to citizenship, which, which, uh, which was unfortunate. But fortunately, President Obama did act, and it allowed 800,000 people to have a life in the United exactly. States. Exactly. So to now be the president's offering 1.8 million people and also a path to citizenship as part of that. He's offering even more than what President Obama had in the original deal. So why won't Democrats who say they want this, that they want to protect? Uh, dreamers and you know children as part of the DACA program. Why won't Democrats get on board with that? Well, I think it's important to also highlight the fact that President Trump struck down deals that were presented to him, bipartisan deals that were presented to him in January and February and even earlier this month that weren't the toxic plans that he put forward. So, so you blame just, him, but you don't blame Democrats people... for the for turning down the offer. Are you equally angry with both sides? I am disappointed with Democrats for not holding the line when they mm -hmm. could have. There could have been a deal made when they had leverage when we were trying to pass spending bills, uh, and they didn't do that, which is really unfortunate. However, they were put in a really difficult position because, yes, we're giving 1.8 million uh, undocumented dreamers a path to citizenship, and we were giving money for the wall. However, we were also going to slash legal immigration by 50 percent well, under the I, president's plan. I mean, we've, we've, we've slashed legal so, immigration many times in this country. You know, it's fascinating because I was just watching Brett Baer a little while ago was interviewing the ambassador from Mexico, and he was talking about the hundreds of thousands of people that they do not allow to stay in their country, that they repatriate to Honduras because they have to control their borders. He said, I want to work with the United States to make sure that we control our borders. So why is it such an alien concept to you? Do, that uh, you know, people would want there to be um, protection for the borders, and that it's not okay to, to be here and overstay your visa or to come here illegally. Yeah, I don't. I don't think it's definitely not foreign to me to uh, to want to have a secure border. I mean, I've lived in the United States since I was 11 years old, so I've dealt with immigration issues personally and professionally. So it's not something that's foreign to me. But I do think that sometimes we conflate issues. So we're trying to conflate the issue of illegal immigration with how people are able to come to the country legally. And if we slash legal immigration, so we're slashing. We're telling people come here legally, do it the right way. But by the way, we're also yeah, you, slashing. We're, as, as a country, you're allowed to regulate that you're what that to number is going to be. Right you don't have to have an open-ended number. You are allowed as a, as a country to say, you know what, this year we're going to take this many, next year we're going to take that many. That, 
I, I can't understand why you would have a problem with that. It's not an open-ended open discussion. That, but I, <laughs> but it should be an open-ended discussion. That's that is correct. What you just said that it should be an open-ended discussion is exactly how no, it I'm should work. No, I'm saying what I meant was it's not an open-ended question. Table, you, you can't just assume that as many people not. want to come in can come in. That's not the way it works. Absolutely. I don't think that that's the way it works either. Uh, I can tell you from personal experience that it, it, you know, it took me 20 years to be able to become an American citizen. Mm -hmm. And it's a very difficult process. That. But yeah. we're also then blaming people and saying, you know, you should make, you should become legal. You should, we, we, we often ask people, why don't you become legal? Why were you undocumented for 15 years without understanding the fact that the line that we often talk about doesn't exist? And so we're telling people, get legal. Don't come here illegally. And at the same time, we're no. saying, 1.8 million people have been offered a, a We're not gonna pathway be able to, to let citizenship come in. and the ability to stay here legally. So, um, but that was it was it was rejected. So, all right, thanks. Um, I'm out of time, but thanks for being here, Jalissa. Good to see you. So, Thank my you next guest me. has been deeply impacted by the issue of illegal immigration. Her son, Sergeant Brendan Mendoza, was on his way home from his shift as a police officer in Mesa, Arizona, four years ago, when he was killed in a head-on collision by someone who turned out to be an illegal immigrant who was driving drunk. That's a beautiful picture of Marianne and her son. Joining me now, uh, they're known as Angel Parents, so Angel Mom, Marianne Mendoza. Um, Marianne, your thoughts on the fact that the president has now said, you know, I'm kind of done negotiating on this. I made an offer. It was not accepted. Um, so DACA is dead. Our politicians don't have to negotiate or offer anything in exchange for doing their job, which is protecting American citizens. The left and the media have given illegal aliens a voice in our country, in our politics and in our news that they have no place being in. These people are illegal aliens who've entered our country illegally. And that's the end of the argument. The DACA program is not an easy yes or no fix because it's, it's wrought with fraud. There are people who are not contributing members of society who are DACA participants. They are on welfare. They are on food stamps. They are getting um, assistance in housing. They get free health care. And these are the types of things in this program that need to be looked at and weed out all of these people and especially the ones who commit crimes who are DACA participants because, believe it or not, folks, it happens. There are many, many people who are DACA participants who have committed crimes. They're allowed to commit up to two misdemeanors um, within the DACA program. Some of them commit felonies. They go before a judge. Their defense attorney fights so that their felony is reduced to a misdemeanor. So they stay within the guidelines of the DACA program. So our politicians need to be looking deep and hard if they're going to even be talking about this DACA program as to how to reform it, not just to vote, yes, it stays, no, it doesn't. That isn't what needs to happen. And what about cutting legal immigration? Listen, our country is overburdened with illegal aliens who are in our country. And so it only makes sense to cut legal immigration at this time when we have to figure out how we're going to close our borders, protect our citizens, and keep the United States the great country that it was because it, it's, look at California and what it's become. That is truly what's gonna start happening within the United States and every state because a lot of these governors and these mayors and these elected officials want to create sanctuary cities for them, sanctuary states. They want to take taxpayer money and create legal you know, funds for them to be able to fight deportation. It's insanity what is happening and our border patrol has a job to do and they were hired for a job and they need to be able to do their job, protect us, secure our borders and our Congress and senators need to get off their duffs mm -hmm. and do the job that they were elected to do and that is to protect us and they are doing far from it when all I hear out of their voice is how much they are wanting to protect illegal aliens in our country who are committing crimes. Marian, thank you. Well put. Uh, as always, good to see you tonight. Marian Mendoza. Thank you, Martha. So Kellyanne Conway firing back against a claim made over the weekend that she's the number one leaker in the White House, which raises a lot of questions for the author who made that accusation, Ronald Kessler, who will join me live. And he's the Saudi prince who locked up his own cousins and corrupt politicians in a Ritz-Carlton in Riyadh. He also, as of today, says that Israel should be an independent state. He is now headed to Hollywood to discuss some things with the folks there. We really have a great friendship, a great relationship. I would really have to say the relationship was, to put it mildly, very, very strained during the Obama administration.
Developing tonight, big changes are coming as John Bolton and Mike Pompeo prepare to move into very powerful positions in the Trump administration. So could this potentially mean the end of the Iran deal, which both men have spoken out against? That is clearly the hope of Saudi Arabia's new 32-year-old crown prince, who after his recent White House visit now seeks to woo the Hollywood crowd, many of whom backed the deal under President Obama. This, as the Saudi crown prince makes headlines tonight, saying in a new interview that Israelis are entitled to live peacefully on their own land and saying that Iran's supreme leader, quote, makes Hitler look good. Trace Gallagher, live in our West Coast newsroom with a look at this rapidly changing dynamic in the Middle East and the man who hopes to redraw the lines of power in the Middle East. Trace. Martha, in the nine months since Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, or MBS, as he's commonly referred to, was named heir to the Saudi throne, he has appointed himself Minister of Defense and first Deputy Prime Minister. So even though he is not yet king, the 32-year-old Crown Prince appears to be the kingdom's de facto leader, which has sparked concerns of a power grab inside the kingdom and has also prompted questions about his regional ambitions. Bin Salman has taken a very hard line against Iran, and it remained unclear what, if any, restraints will be placed on him by the nomination of Mike Pompeo as Secretary of State and the selection of John Bolton as National Security Advisor. The Crown Prince is already leading a military effort in Yemen against the Iran-backed Shiite Houthi rebels. And during his current trip to the U.S., bin Salman reportedly secured a deal with Boeing to become the Saudi military's sole provider of maintenance for the kingdom's warplanes. Overall, the Crown Prince's two-and-a-half-week tour of the U.S. is less about buying and more about selling, specifically selling the U.S. a rebranded image of Saudi Arabia. The prince's PR campaign went from D.C. to Hollywood to Silicon Valley with an exclusive pit stop on 60 Minutes to expand, expound on how the kingdom is loosening its adherence to fundamentalist Sunni law and allowing women more freedoms like driving and attending mixed gender events like soccer. Saudi Arabia has also lifted a 35-year-old ban on movie theaters and is active wooing Hollywood with the hope of generating a billion dollars a year in movie ticket sales. But entertainment is only part of the kingdom's effort to diversify away from oil. During his visit, the Crown Prince met with Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, Michael Bloomberg, gathering advice and ideas on how to achieve his goal of becoming a global investment powerhouse. Though human rights groups say the glitter can't hide the gore and that Saudi Arabia's brutal crackdown on dissent and minority rights remains active and painfully real. Martha. Trace, thank you. Here now, Ari Fleischer, former White House press secretary under President George W. Bush. He's now Fox News contributor and Michael Waltz, a former Green Beret commander and former counterterrorism advisor to Vice President Dick Cheney. Fascinating to see the shift that is happening here because under the Obama administration, there was a lot of dialogue happening with the Shia side of, uh, of right. the Middle East, with, with Iran, with, you know, and they're obviously they are involved with Syria and, and a little bit of back turning against Saudi Arabia and the Sudan side of our typical alliances. Um, you know, Colonel Waltz, let me start with you on this. Do, sure. do you believe what you're seeing here? And do you think it's wise um, for us to have this strong alliance with Saudi Arabia? Well, the fundamental question here is Mohammed bin Salman, uh, is he genuine about expelling and mitigating extremism in the kingdom and therefore across the Middle East? Or is, just this, is this just a power grab? And I would, uh, I would argue both. Uh, he had to grab power in a very forceful way in order to break the last several decades of this deal with the old guard Saudis and the extremists in Saudi Arabia, where one essentially turned the back on, on the other. The administration has put their chips on Mohammed bin Salman at the advice of our yeah. allies in Jordan and the UAE. I think that is a huge gamble, but so far the right one. Look, Martha, they had three priorities coming in. One, annihilate ISIS. Two, uh, uh, move the Gulf, Gulf states away from extremism. And three, roll back Iran, who has made more gains in the last eight years under Obama than they had in the last thousand. And the first two are, yeah. are we're moving along, and we'll see what happens with Iran over the, this next year. We will see. A very strong statement, Ari, in terms of Israel's right to their own land. That is not a popular idea um, in Iran or you know, Hezbollah, Hamas. That is not an idea that they would ever be okay with.
There is a remarkable shift underway in the Middle East, and frankly, the president deserves credit because the Absolutely. president has been one of the people leading this shift. Mm -hmm. What you saw is the previous administration was aligned with Iran, and they had their allies with uh, Qatar and Hezbollah and Syria. And this administration is working much more with the moderate Sunni Arabs, Egypt, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, and of course Israel. Israel, amazingly, has been a part of this shift. The Arab nations, including Saudi Arabia, have been working behind the scenes with Israel. In much case, many cases, it's because of the animosity because of, uh, aimed at Iran and protecting themselves from Iran. And Israel and Saudi Arabia have a common enemy there. But I think this is legit. I think it's real. I hope it's successful. You know, the Arab Middle East, unlike the Asian Muslim world, has been moving backwards. It's been moving in an extremist de direction for decades. And if this is a real attempt by Saudi Arabia to marginalize the extremists and step into the 21st century, they still have a long way to go. And they have political reforms that yeah. are necessary. But this is an encouraging development. Colonel Watson, you know, I, it, when you look back in the history of Saudi Arabia, they, in some ways, you know, the understanding was that they appeased their own terrorists in some ways. They wanted to maintain power as a royal family in Saudi Arabia. We all know that, you know, 11 of the hijackers on 9-11 came from mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia. And they had this sort of delicate balance in their own country in order to stay in power and to keep things moving. This is a person who's putting himself out there in a way that they are going to be very unhappy yeah. with. Women driving, people going to the movie theaters. This is exactly what they've been trying to keep the lid on. Um, how is it, do you, how how secure is this guy? I guess is, is really the question because he's got a lot of people who'd love yeah. to see him gone. Well, you know, in, in fairness, the, the Saudi move uh, towards, you know, Sunni extremism was in response to the Iranian revolution uh, mm -hmm. when the Ayatollahs uh, took charge. And we've seen, you know, essentially the genie out of the bottle now with Al Qaeda and ISIS uh, mm -hmm. and, and all types of groups. But, you know, again, uh, Ari's right. The Trump administration deserves credit here. Where was the president's first trip overseas uh, to Saudi Arabia, to Riyadh, where he very rightly put his finger in the moderate uh, Arab government's chest and said, you have to solve this from within. Uh, the United States can only do so much and we can only do so much across all of these battlefields from Afghanistan to Syria mm -hmm. and that we have to undermine the ideology. And then his next trip was where? To Israel. And that has been the mm -hmm. pillar of his Middle East strategy. Remarkable changes. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Great to all see right. you both. Thank you. So coming up, we will take a look at a story that has... Uh, gotten a lot of attention today. Kellyanne Conway firing back at the author of a bombshell new book, claims a lot of things, among them that she was the leaker in the White House. Will he stand by those claims tonight? Ron Kessler, exclusively here on The Story, next. We're going to find the leakers. We're going to find the leakers. They're going to pay a big price for leaking. He knows, and he has said publicly and privately, who the leakers and the liars are and have been very happy that there's a lot less leaking in the White House now. Leakers get great press, and one day, Abby, I will have my say. Mm. Kellyanne Conway denying accusations in a bombshell new book that she is the worst leaker in the White House. The book, The Trump White House, Changing the Rules of the Game, uh, is based on, uh, according to Ron Kessler, interviews that he did with the president and with his staff here now exclusively. Ron Kessler, the book's author, former Wall Street Journal and Washington Post reporter. Good to see you uh, Good tonight, to you. Ron. Thank you for being here. Congratulations um, on your new book. Um, so what, what you say is leaking um, really Maybe, you know, how would you describe it? What do you mean the worst, the worst leaker? Well, when I interviewed her uh, at the White House and it was recorded, uh, she apparently forgot that she was on the record and she started uh, lambasting other colleagues. She said uh, these nasty, uh, obviously untrue things about Ryan's Priebus, uh, so nasty and cutting that I, I don't include it but in the book. But that strikes me as, you know, even if, if that was the case and you say you have a recording, but you didn't add those, you didn't put those details in the book because you said you, you didn't yeah. think it was nice or right. Um, mm. But that sounds like gossipy stuff. Well, to me, it leaks, like to say someone's the worst leaker in the White House, mm. I'm thinking about national security issues, policy issues. Those mm. are the things that we've seen coming out of the White House. Yeah, well, was, You're not suggesting that she's behind those, are you? Not, not behind that. So that would be the worst leaker. Yeah. No, right? but in addition, I've interviewed aides who say that they have seen texts from her to reporters in which they are, in which she is leaking, not national security, but leaking. Right, but, leaking. but wouldn't you agree so, as a, I know, you know, you're a longtime reporter, that the real problem 
would be somebody who's leaking things about a conversation with foreign leaders. Those are the things that we've seen landing on the front pages of the paper. Well, so well, I would reserve perhaps the worst leaker or number one for something that jeopardizes national security, something of weight and substance. Hmm. Wouldn't you agree? Well, I would. Because I would there say, are people who are doing that. Do you know right. that? Oh, yeah. But in terms of volume. Who are they? Who is doing that? We don't know that yet. But in terms of, you know, just volume, this is someone who, who constantly uh, castigates her colleagues. And that is a big pro right. problem in the White House. Uh, let me, you know, that, that, that's a matter of, you know, uh, opinion, I guess. Yeah. Um, in terms of, of the interview, when did you do the exclusive interview? It says exclusive. When did you do your sit-down exclusive interview with President okay. Trump for this book? This was the night before New Year's Eve. We went to the New Year's Eve party at Mar-a-Lago, as we have been for doing for two decades. And uh, so this past New Year's Eve. Yeah, and the night before, about 10:30 at night at Mar-a-Lago, uh, he agreed to this interview. And and uh, uh, so did you sit down alone, the two of you in a room? Uh, we were in the living room of Mar-a-Lago. Melania had supported the idea. She she uh, pushed doing it right away, or at least arranging it right away. Uh, my wife, Pam, a former Washington Post reporter, was there. and uh, So just the four of you were in that room uh, at that time? There were others in the room. But we were off in a corner, mm -hmm. Trump, and also his uh, body uh, aide, as they call him, John, uh, Mac John McEntee, was there. So you, you actually say, mm -hmm. you argue in the book that Melania Trump sits in on cabinet meetings. Mm -hmm. um, is that true? Yeah. I, I was just talking to Shulkin uh, at, at uh, another network, and he said that They've uh, had discussions, the three of them, in which she contributes her, her thoughts. Sometimes she disagrees with Trump. Right. Uh, and uh, just on a regular basis, I, I, on the record in the book, I have people like Ryan Priebus describing how uh, she helps to shape the uh, meetings and, and sums up what other people are saying and then comes up with her own solutions. Totally Would you say more so because I know you, you wrote a book on Laura Bush, you know, and mm -hmm. we all, you know, think of the first ladies and obviously every wife has an, a lot of influence. It's a partnership that mm -hmm. you share mm -hmm. um, with your husband. And when he's in this position, there's no d doubt you're going to share your, w would you say more so than Laura Bush or more is, so than Rosalind Carter, who yeah. was definitely sitting in on cabinet meetings? I don't know about that part, but uh, definitely more than Laura, because Laura, of course, would give her opinion to her husband, but she didn't sit in on meetings, didn't discuss things with aides. This is quite different. Basically, Melania acts an, as another powerful aide. And that came from, aide. from Shulkin? Well, no, it came from Rance Priebus, John Spicer, okay. a few others on the record. Um, and okay. by the way, this book is the book that Trump fans have been waiting for. Uh, there really has not been a, a book that looks at the positive side, but at the same time uh, reveals negative items, just like the Kellyanne item, uh, and also juicy tidbits and, and how he makes decisions, mm -hmm. the behind the scenes of, of why he selected or didn't select uh, Romney, Giuliani, Sessions, Bolton. Uh, the reason he didn't take him the first time was he was uh, that he, he thought he was too hawkish. Now he, and he didn't like the mustache. Exactly. Yeah, he's very big on, on, on appearances. Thank you very much, Ron. Yeah. Good luck. Thanks. Good to see you tonight. Thank you. So this story coming up next, for decades we knew very little about what really happened that night in Chappaquiddick. But now a new movie that is opening this week sheds light on the tragedy. Up next, Howie Carr on the very powerful people that he says tried to keep this movie from ever seeing the light of day. Next. This breaking story just moments ago in a new op-ed posted to the Washington Post website, Jill McCabe, who you see on the left, the wife of the fired FBI director, now lashing out at President Trump herself, defending the hundreds of thousands of dollars of donations that she got, as you may remember, when she ran for office in Virginia from Terry McAuliffe's PAC. The op-ed reads this in part. To have my personal reputation and integrity and those of my family attacked in this way is beyond horrible. I feel awful every day. It keeps me up nights. Now that I can speak on my own behalf, I want people to know that the whole story that everything is based on is just false and utterly absurd, she writes. So more on that as we get it. This country has a deep connection to the Kennedy name, and that is a valuable thing, gentlemen. And we can't just let that go to waste. We need to remind the American people what this family has been through and how much more we have left to achieve. 
That is a clip from the very good upcoming movie, Chappaquiddick, which hits theaters on Friday. The movie centers around the night that Ted Kennedy drove off a bridge, leading to the death of 28-year-old Mary Jo Kopechny, who had worked on Bobby Kennedy's campaign. Tonight, there is new drama, though, surrounding this movie after one of the producers suggested that powerful people have been trying to stop it from ever being released. My next guest has a hunch about who that could be. Howie Carr is a Boston Herald columnist and author of What Really Happened in the 2016 Election. Howie, good evening. Good to see you. Uh, uh, good to have you on the show tonight. So when I, I interviewed uh, one of the producers of the show, not the person that you spoke with, and he suggested as well to me that there, you know, oh, was little, there was some pushback. It was kind of difficult getting this made, but we really tried to be respectful to both sides. You, you think it was stronger than that? Right. Uh, Byron Allen, the uh, executive producer, he just bought the Weather Channel last week for $300 million. Very successful guy. He told Variety that, quote, unquote, very powerful people had tried to stop it. I would have to say, Martha, the most obvious suspect would be Christopher Dodd. He was a mm. former senator from Connecticut, a good, big, long-time sure. drinking buddy and pal of uh, Ted Kennedy. They were involved in many numerous uh, escapades in D.C. And he later became the president of the uh, Motion Picture Association of America, the MPAA, until last uh, December. And I think he would be the one who would make the uh, overture to uh, Byron Allen to stop it. And Byron Allen uh, refuses to to say publicly, and, and uh, I wrote a column about this for my newspaper, the Boston Herald, on, uh, on Sunday, and uh, I, I reached out to the MPAA, and I said, can we get a statement from uh, Senator Dodd one way or the other? Did he try to uh, strong arm uh, Byron Allen, the producer of Chappaquiddick, into killing the movie? They did not uh, respond to my inquiry. When you guys called me this afternoon, I called again, and uh, I emailed again, still no response. So the uh, Chris Dodd is uh, remaining uh, silent about whether or not he tried to kill this oh, film. It's a very interesting theory. Uh, it's well done and it comes out this week. Howie, thank you very much. Good to see you tonight. Thank you, Martha. Quick